Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Southern Voices Network for Peace Building Annual Conference, Business Unusual. A rapidly changing world calls for adapting peace building in Africa session on women and African peace and security agenda. My point of passion. <laughs> My name is Helen Kezi Angoha, and I'm the executive director of the Women's International Peace Center based in Uganda. On behalf of the Southern Voices Network for Peace Building and Wilson Center, thank you for joining us in person and online for this session. The Southern Voices Network for Peace Building, or SVNP, is a network of 22 African policy and research organizations that work with the Wilson Center African Program to bring African analysis and perspectives to key issues in US-African relations. Generously funded by Carnegie Corporation of New York since 2011, the project provides avenues for African researchers to engage with, inform, and exchange perspectives with US and international policymakers in order to develop the most appropriate, cohesive, and inclusive policy frameworks for the issues of peace building and state building in Africa, including our topic today. And you will all agree with me that you wouldn't be speaking peace building without talking about women, peace, and security. Yes, <laughs> 2020 marked 20 years since the adoption of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security, what we popularly call WPS. Um, research and observations show that progress has been made uh, with further effort towards prioritizing WPS agenda made at various levels, such as African Union Strategy for Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment. But also at the African Union, we've also seen a lot of progress with the appointment of a special envoy on women, peace, and security. Uh, but in addition to that, we also see the establishment of the Women's Mediators Network to promote women's participation in peace building and I'm proudly a member of that network. The EU Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security and the United States Strategy on Women, Peace, and Security. So globally, we see a lot of progress in terms of these frameworks. What we don't know is how these frameworks have translated into having more women at the peace table or how the Women, Peace, and Security agenda has led to more sustainable peace globally and in Africa. So this session, we hope, with my excellent panel here, we take stock of the current state of the implementation of the WPS agenda to evaluate the key issues and challenges. We will assess how global developments have impacted the WPS agenda and what this means for inclusive peace building. Looking beyond hard security, this, se this session will also address how peace building can or should be adapted for more effectively support WPS and peace building in Africa. With the kind of CV I have here, I know that justice will be done to this topic. I would like to briefly introduce our speakers today. Um, from my right, Professor Krisova Isike, Miss Miriam Mona Mukalazi, my Ugandan sister, and Miss Elizabeth Henley, and I hope she's on the way. Each of them have been asked to speak to the topic women and the African peace and security agenda from their own perspectives and offer recommendations or areas of focus to enhance peace building in Africa. Each speaker will be offered eight minutes of initial remarks, and I've whispered to my panelists that eight minutes is eight minutes. And I'm not going to send reminders but I'll stop you after eight minutes. And after that, we would go into Q&A sessions uh, with the audience, and I would also want to appeal to the audience to keep it to Q&A. We are live tweeting today's event and taking questions online. To join the discussion, you can follow along on our Twitter account at African Close Up using the hashtag peacebuildinginafrica. 
to ask a question, you may tweet or use the chat box function on the event web page. So let me turn to our first speaker, Professor Christopher Isike. He is a professor of African politics, African development, and international relations at the University of Pretoria, South Africa. He is also the director of the African Center for the Study of the US. He's a political scientist and Africanist. His research interests include diaspora diplomacy of African diaspora in America, peace and conflict studies, women and political representation in Africa, and I can go on and on and on. So I would like to leave it there, but ask um, Professor Isika to give his initial remarks for eight minutes. Your eight minutes starts, sir. Two, you will get you will get fifteen minutes each. That's what he promised. <laughs> anyway, people break and make and break promises, so no problem. Um, look, good afternoon. Um, in order to keep within that eight minutes, so that I don't talk too much, I have written down a few things that I will just speak from, and then uh, spend if I have more time talking the other things. But basically, to answer three questions: one, um, what is the current state of the uh, WPS agenda in Africa? That's the Women, Peace, and Security agenda, and the key issues and challenges for the, the WPS in, in Africa. So um, we all know that the WPS agenda stems from um, the UN Security Council Resolution 30, 1325 and nine other landmark resolutions, the latest one being the um, resolution 2493, which was in 2019. Um, and, and, and they provide a framework for women's participation in conflict resolution, peacekeeping, and uh, peace building. The resolutions attempt to ensure that women's rights in conflict zones are protected and that war crimes against women are prosecuted. They also call for more in women inclusion, uh, more women in conflict mediation, peace talks, um, and security forces in overseeing ceasefires and you know, in peace building institutions. For example, the United Nations targets are 15% of women uh, serving in military contingents and 25% for military observers and staff uh, you know, officers. Um, so, so, so now building on, 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 on the four pillars of the Women, Peace and Security um, uh, uh, agenda, um, which are prevention, participation, uh, um, relief and recovery, the AU, the African Union, has adopted you know, a variety of norms, policies, and frameworks, including the Solemn Declaration on Gender Equality in, in Africa, the Maputo Protocol, um, um, the African uh, Union Agenda 2063, which uh, with particular reference to Aspiration 6, that looks at the centrality of women in, in Africa's development. It also established the uh, Special Envoy on WPS, um, which um, uh, Madam um, Helen referred to. Um, there's also the joint um, EU-Africa strategy, um, you know, given the co shared commitments between the EU and, and the EU on the, the WPS. Um, and then also the African Peace and Security Council created the network of um, African women in conflict pre prevention and, and mediation. That was in 2017. And I also want to add the AU uh, strategy on gender and women empowerment, which is expected to promote you know, these efforts. Now, a critical one that is worth mentioning for me is the um, 2019 launching of the AU Continental Resource Framework. Um, for monitoring and reporting on the implementation of the WPS agenda in Africa. This is very important given the major challenge of implementation, which hampers the many laudable frameworks that the AU has, uh, our regional economic commissions, and, and the national governments in, in, in general. Now, the CRF, which is the Continental Resource Framework, capitalizes on the reforms of uh, laws, policies, and institutions currently occurring in the context of Agenda 2063 for the continent's transformation, right? So um, at national levels in the last 20 years especially, we have seen um, over half of the EAU member states, that's about 32 of them, um, having developed national action plans which serve as blueprints for implementing uh, the WPS agenda. Some of them, uh, such as the Nigerian one, which I'm a bit familiar with, um, localized and adopted a 5P priority model, which is prevention, participation, protection, promotion, and prosecution. 
Um, in the last 10 years, these uh, national action plans have evolved to become uh, better structured with 88% of them now having, you know, monitoring frameworks uh, with, you know, um, you know um, uh, indicators that we can, we can measure. Uh, so all of these remain an important institutional tool for governments to align policy commitments and action that are vital to long-term realization of the agenda. However, there are several challenges, you know, that um, uh, the WPS has thrown up. Um, if I'm to look at the Nigerian one specifically, we have challenges, uh, you know, that at uh, the institutional or state level, you look at um, the non-inclusion of violent extremism in the uh, National Action Plan, limited consideration of post-conflict and reintegration issues, um, the use of ambiguous language, uh, which was again, which was corrected in the second version of the National Action Plan in 2017. Um, and then, of course, the usual problem of uh, inadequate monitor and uh, evaluation um, architecture. But at the more general level, there are several others that one can talk about. You know, for instance, the meaningful engagement and inclusion of women in the peace process in Africa has been consistently overlooked. Uh, one of the key factors involved um, uh, that is not really exclusive to Africa is the weak resource mobilization to implement the agenda. Um, few donor states have complied with the you know, UN target to allocate 15% of peace building, peace building funding. Um, and in some cases, you know, um, there is no resource uh, allocation at all. There are several other challenges w I can talk about, uh, but because of time, um, I would, you know, oh, just trying to, I'm trying to time myself, okay, but um, four minutes, yeah, okay. So um, um, the, the two that I really want to talk about um, uh, are one, the non-recognition of women's uh, informal peace building agency, um, and then also the, the second one speaks to um, the, the lack of provision for confronting, you know, the psychosocial causes of gender-based violence, um, which constrain women's peace agency in many ways. So, for instance, talking about the first one, the Kofi Annan International uh, 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 Peacekeeping um, Center, Training Center, the KAIPTC, um, uh, it's, which is an ECOWAS mandated, you know, training center for excellence in Africa report that in West Africa and the Sahel, um, these are the leading, you know, uh, 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 community efforts to build a positive peace that prevents and mitigates, you know, collective violence. However, they need to be able to bring that expertise to the table of peace processes with the ability to fully, uh, uh, to, 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 to be fully uh, and equitably or equally uh, involved, right? Now, so these two for me are important challenges because um, I think that um, if you look at the cases of Sierra Leone and, and if you look at um, you know, the way that women were involved in peace building in, in the Niger Delta, for instance, Nigeria, and then um, 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 in, you know, the um, Zululand in South Africa, you will find that there were various um, um, informal uh, ways that women actually participated, but these informal ways, which are usually not documented, are you know absent? Uh, uh, they, are, they, are, they are usually not reckoned with because they are not known. However, it doesn't mean that women are not participating. And if we begin to formalize, find ways to mainstream, mainstream informal uh, peace building activities that women engage in, you will find that, that we, we may see a higher number of women, uh, you know, participating actively. Uh, and we just need to formalize and recognize, um, uh, uh, you know, these these this, this processes. And then, in, in terms of you know the, the 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 absence of you know, confronting the psychosocial causes of gender-based violence, um, you know, there's been a lot of um, you know gender national action plans to deal with gender-based violence across a lot of these countries. The problem remains that none of them tend to, uh, you know, uh, deal with the psychosocial causes of gender-based violence in terms of how men see women. Um, we, we think that um, most of the way, the, the way that men see women inform how men behave towards women. Um, in a study that I conducted in KwaZulu-Natal, for example, asked a group of young boys and men over a three-year period, and the simple question I asked all of them in focus group discussions was, what, how do you see women? And I got answers like women are snakes, women are properties, women are sexual objects. So if you look at psychological fee theory and you try and re relay the connection between perception and behavior, you begin to understand how 
you know, a perception of women as a snake would inform how a man would deal with a woman. Uh, so, so for me, until we make efforts, put policies in place that will address, uh, you know, those paradigm shift thought patterns, those, the additional causes in effect, we will not be able to do much in addressing uh, gender-based uh, violence. So to the second question um, of how, um, you know, COVID-19, for example, has impacted on the WPS, uh, and, and what this means for inclusive and sustainable peace building, there are many ways this has um, happened, uh, but you know, um, I, I can say that some of the um, 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 uh, national action plans of states are behind. Um, you know, targets due to these delays in implementation caused by restrictive measures put in place by COVID-19 pandemic, and then women were disproportionately affected by the uh, COVID pandemic um, uh, because they were exposed to a, a you know a shadow pandemic of. Um, um, sexual and gender-based violence. In fact, South Africa during the period uh, declared uh, gender-based violence as a second pandemic facing the country in 2020. Um, so uh, we, this came up with, with hard lockdown measures that kept families confined. Um, but you know, even despite that, women were in the front lines in the fight against the pandemic as essential workers and leading organizations for peace and security and the development uh, and development like the African Women Leadership Network, working with the UN and the EU to develop policies, strategies, and guidelines for COVID-19 gender responsive actions. Um, I will also probably talk about the fact that um, as a result of its high exposure and vulnerability to climate hazards, one third of the people considered mostly at risk uh, in the world live in Africa, especially in the Sahel, the, the Lake Chad Basin, the Horn of Africa and Southern Africa, where the drivers of violence uh, you know, are exacerbated by uh, uh, factors such as climate change and exposes and exploits you know, existing um, uh, vulnerabilities. All of the largest UN African missions are in, uh, are in climate change hotspots, including South Sudan, Mali, the DRC, um, Central African Republic, Sudan, and Somalia. The increased strain on peace operation have a negative effect on the um, WPS agenda. Um, because of time, let me just go to the last point that uh, 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 talks about what can be done differently in, in line with business unusual to, 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 move, to, 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 to make the WPS more effective. Uh, so so I, would, I would talk about, you know, um, establishing a high level engagement between the CSO, NGOs, states, and their security institutions, developing an implementation framework that puts research um, at, the, at the fore, um, localizing security and peace discussions to ensure better relations between women and uh, you know, ag security agencies, um, and there's needs to earmark um, um, large funds uh, allocated specifically to large and uh, large funds, sorry, uh, allocated specifically to. Um, the WPS to at least 15% of peace and security funding while ensuring transparency to track and monitor expenditures uh, on WPS related uh, programs and then uh, resilient strategies that center on local solutions are needed you know to mitigate the negative impacts of climate change I think I have my cue already and I will stop here and see how I engage more with some of these points during the Q&A session but thank you thank you for doing 10 minutes I kept my promise even if I didn't say it. So thank you so much, thank you. Um, and and just, like, just as you said it, I was wondering in my mind how the men who are seated in this room would describe women. I hear you talking about snakes, and I really wish I would be described like a snake, because I will so bite you um, dangerously. Um, but that's very interesting you know, to know and to hear. So um, I go to my second speaker, Ms. Miriam Mona Mukalazi. She's a visiting researcher at the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security in Washington, DC, and a research fellow of the European Chalmers Academy. Uh, she's a PhD researcher um, studying the African Union and European Union's Women, Peace, and Security agenda. Uh, Miriam has worked for the World Bank, UN Women, the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, something that I also have a lot of interest in. Um, um, and we really would love to hear from you, Miriam, you know, what your perspectives are with regards to the work you're doing and the current topic that we're dealing with. Over to you, Miriam. 
Yeah, thank you so much for having me and also for this really warm welcome. Um, as my colleague here has already introduced um, the frameworks that we are having uh, on the African continent, I can dive into um, more into the critical um, perspective of the WPS agenda. Um, maybe like shortly, like just about me, as you can hear, I have an accent. So uh, I was born and raised in Germany, uh, but parts of my family is from Uganda. And uh, growing up on both continents has, I guess, also led to my research topic, um, which is about the European Union and the African Union and the WPS agenda. And what I'm looking at um, in my research is to understand what the understanding of gender, gender equality, but also of gender security is on the African continent and the European continent. Because there are differences, um, and I'm also trying to understand how those differences may, might be helpful and might not be. Um, actually, and so during my research, I was interviewing uh, officials from the African Union, European Union, but also from the UN, um, to better get a like to get a better understanding. What makes both of those institutions so interesting when we look at the WPS agenda is that they are both like both are having a really really strong um, policy framework. They are committing to the WPS agenda, um, where we have like other regional organizations that are still kind of at the beginning of um, drafting those uh, agenda um, frameworks. And what is also really interesting, um, I mean, there is a so-called long-standing relationship between the African continent and the European one. And um, it is a relationship uh, based on the colonial legacy and um, that is still re relevant for today's um, yeah, policy making and policy designing. But the question is also, okay, taking that into account, how do we move forward from that and actually um, encounter certain narratives that uh, gender equality um, is something um, imported by certain actors. When we look at the African Union, uh, my colleague has already mentioned the four pillars, um, and um, the African Union is really, really strong when it comes to the participa participation pillar. Um, I think mainly the reason is, um, in contrast to the European Union, the African Union has understood that when we talk about gender perspectives, the culture context is really, really important. Uh, when we look at the European Union, the European Union always presents itself as like a neutral actor. Um, also, when we talk about yeah, when we talk about gender um, equality, um, as if gender equality is in every context the same, and and that that's not it's not. And uh, I think this is also something where the African uh, where the European Union can learn from the African Union to understand that context matters. And also um, that diverse, like the uh, diverse um, uh, identities um, people are having, also matters for conflict resolution and um, transformation. One example is that, uh, as we know, on the African continent, there are so many different religious uh, groups, um, ethnicities, etc. And this is really taken into account when we look at all the strategies, not only on the regional level, but also on the national level um, of different WPS actors um, on the continent. Whereas the European Union um, is struggling um, still to understand what those intersection um, means for conflict resolutions. Of course, we have the uh, gender action plan uh, of the European Union, um, where there's a strong linkage um, to uh, the WPS agenda in general, and also um, the term intersectionality is a fundament of this gender action plan, which means, again, taking into account intersecting forms um, of oppression and ex uh, exclusion. Um, but this has just been um, introduced um, a few years ago. So again, I guess the European Union can learn a lot from the African Union. And another point is also, we talked about already this uh, special envoy um, of the African Union. Here we can also see a strong difference, like a, a huge difference between those 
organizations uh, because the Special Envoy has a background um, regarding civil society um, 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 yeah, work on, on, on topics as fem like feminism and gender equality, um, which is a really strong indicator because the, um, on how the WPS agenda is actually working because the WPS agenda has been pushed and initiated by civil society and uh, civil society still today um, informs um, the global strategy um, um, intensively. And we can also see that civil society from the African uh, continent, although there are so many barriers, um, successfully transfers their knowledge to a UN um, headquarters in New York or even into the UN Security Council. Whereas um, uh, the European Union's, um, um, yeah, she's not like a, a special envoy, but there's also like um, um, uh, a special position uh, on, 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 on now gender and diversity. Um, they're usually appointed through their governments. Um, so there's not such a strong linkage to civil society, um, although they're also like trying. It would be unfair to say that there's no linkage at all. Um, another point I would like to uh, mention is that when we look at the African Union, there has been the campaign silencing the guns by 2020. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, but uh, what the African Union did was linking also this general uh, campaign to the WPS agenda. And this is also something the European Union is struggling with to get the WPS agenda out of its um, um, silo into other as aspects um, of the European Union. And I'm not saying that everything is perfect, but I think this silence in the gun um, campaign is a good example. Um, although there we could also see, um, and I think that it's true for both organizations, um, that there with the WPS agenda, there's always the phenomenon um, of hypervisibility of women. So um, you can see it, I don't know, on, on photos, you can see it in reports that there is a lot of mentioning then of um, women and girls, women and girls like overemphasizing it. Um, and I think this is like also a risk because it's not just about hypervisibility, it's actually also about like thinking, like we heard before, what, what do people in general think about gender, gender stereotypes? and um, how to encounter them. Um, Can I still have? Okay. Um, maybe. <laughs> um, also, silence in the guns. Um, what, we, uh, what we can see there is that there's also a focus on uh, the military, how women participate in the military. And whether this is good or bad, I, I leave that like for this up to um, discussion. And, um, but also here, uh, the African Union has understood that women can have uh, multi like various identities. Uh, women are not only victims, although because of their status and society, uh, they're really vulnerable in times of um, uh, conflicts, but also in times of peace. I mean, this is also like a fact. Um, but um, women are also like, so called like the term that is being used often agents of change and they are also um, um, yeah um, caregivers um, etc so I think uh, to close my uh, eight minutes or to finish my eight minutes um, I think what we should really focus on is how we can um, actually use those different understandings of uh, what is gender, what is gender equality, what is peace, and uh, not to um, divide um, us, more like to, to bring us together on one table and to think about how we can move forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. You did exactly 10 minutes, um, like Professor Isika, so I kept my promise. So we are going to go into Q&A, but just to, to add to some of the points about the efforts of the African Union, is also to mention that 
there's the Livingston formula that allows um, the open section uh, with civil society organizations that is usually organized around um, the anniversary, which is in October, uh, provides opportunity for women to interact with the AU uh, Peace and Security Council, you know, and there are plans on the way for this, for this year. Um, your research findings are quite interesting, Miriam, um, and I really wish that, you know, we, we have lessons to learn from each other, the two continents, um, in terms of the WPS agenda. Um, I would like maybe when you take questions to talk a bit about the feminist foreign policies um, that is currently being promoted, um, you know, uh, here and in the in the EU and how these, if this has any opportunities to promote the WPS agenda or not. So we are taking questions um, both online and in house, and um, I would like to. Um, request that you keep to one question, please. Um, leave the comments for after the session um, so that we can have time to for them to speak more in terms of the issues that you're going to raise. So I'm going to start from this side. Yes, please. Any other person before we start? Okay, so one person from this yeah. session. My name is... My, my yeah, name I'll is come to this side. My name is Shotola Olushegu from Initiative for Public Policy okay. Analysis Nigeria. My question is to Miriam. Um, you have worked in Europe, you know, you know, given your experience around you know, women policy, and then given your background also as an African, you know, can, you, can you do a comparison to show the where you think they are going in terms of how it has evolved you know, over the years? Um, oh, should I ask directly? Yeah, I'll take two more. Okay. <laughs> Okay, yes, please. Yes, I, I would like to have your advice. You seem to be an uh, expert on the question of uh, women and uh, involving the peace uh, matters. Um, I've been accompanying a number of women for peace negotiation, and my, uh, my disappointment was the fact that, especially when we are dealing with rebel groups, that at the end of the day, what the, the women will come to tell to you, it is what they've learned from their colleagues, male, who have, have guns. So how do we deal with that? Okay, thank you. Any more from this side? Okay, please, here. Um, Augustino from South Sudan. Um, I would like to hear from you to how the international framework around peace and security with respect to women um, have actually been localized because that's, that's, that's a serious problem. So I come from South Sudan where you have a policy from the government which says in the leadership, for example, 35% of the leadership should be women, uh, but you end up having about 19%. This is now a local commitment. How are we translating the international commitment? Mm. Okay, so. Okay, can I start? Yes, please. All right, okay, so the one question that, um, or maybe the other one about um, <coughs> women, uh, you know, coming to speak um, the agenda of the um, um, Bushmen. Um, uh, look, we must understand it from the perspective uh, that um, women are not just victims of, of conflict. Um, we've always, most national action plans that try to want to, uh, you know, um, modify or localize the, um, AP, the WPS um, agenda um, have tended to see women only as victims. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a problem. Women are not just victims. They are, I'm not saying they are not victims, but they are also uh, active actors um, in terms of conflicts um, and also they also have that peace agency so that for me should um, speak to how we we see women and the, uh, giving them a right to the peace table the former peace table that is um, so the expectation that when women uh, first you have to ask the question of those women um, how did they how did they get how did they get invited who invited them 
Um, usually, if the benefactors are men, then they, they, are, they, they are responsible to the men who appointed them to, to come and speak. But when you go to the, um, you know, to, 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 to informal sectors, and that's why we, we, we really look at women involvement in, in informal peace building, you'll find that they have their own structure. Some of them are cultural structures. Um, in South Sudan, for example, I mean, Sudan, for example the, the Muslim women had their own uh, interpretation of peace and, 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 and Islam that, 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 that made them to come up with you know, suggestions on how to enable peace. So the mode of entry is my simple answer. Um, that if you if you are, if you are, if you approach mode of entry questions in terms of how women come to those peace tables correctly, you'll find that, that women have just to speak for themselves. Um, that's one. Then secondly, let's not forget that you know uh, the patriarchal marginalization of women in society um, is not it's not something that is that is new. It's age long, and sometimes women themselves too have been conditioned, you know, um, to 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 act in ways that um, gender ways that society has prescribed rules for them. So that's how I would want to understand that. In terms of how international frameworks um, have been localized. Um, it again speaks to the question of um, mode of entry. Um, even in politics, there's a relationship between uh, political representation of women and their representation uh, at peace uh, tables. Um, if we don't get um, adequate representation in politics, it's be it becomes difficult for women to be um, uh, represented in peace tables. But the challenge is, um, the, apart from mode of entry, there, there, there is a challenge of how um, you know, women themselves, um, you know, articulate some of the challenges that, that you know, um, they face. So um, 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 when, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you look at, um, when you look at the mode of, I, 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 I still keep going to the, the, the question of, you know, the mode of entry. Um, the fact that when they get into uh, politics, for instance, there is this tendency to, 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 to act like men, um, and, and, and this, this affects their performance. Also, the issue of structures, um, you know, that, 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 that looks at you know, going beyond numbers to look at the constraining environment. How does the environment that women operate in, uh, say, for instance, parliament, how, 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 how feminized are those environment? And all of these have an impact on, 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 on their performance. Um, I would stop and give you a chance to um, maybe give it a go. Thank you. Um, regarding how um, the WPS agenda has evolved, um, I can give like two examples like one, a positive one, um, I start with that one. Um, you can see that um, over the years, like since, the, since 2000 with the first uh, resolution, 1325, uh, until now, the, the wording, for example, has changed and therefore also um, part of the understanding of our survivor-centered approach because um, for a really long time, the focus was mainly on um, yeah, women and, and girls um, as victims, and um, they're like full stop. But there wasn't really a talk about, okay, let's talk about the trauma um, those um, yeah, persons are um, experiencing, but also what kind of um, access to health uh, and um, also economic um, institutions and services um, people need that have experienced um, sexual violence. So I think there, there has been like um, positive in, um, development to understand or get more like a holistic approach and also to find out what um, needs to be done um, um, on the long term. Um, maybe a kind of a negative uh, development is that, um, but it doesn't, isn't it just the case for the WPS agenda, I think in general for gender policies, then um, certain institutions think if they have one woman, um, um, it is enough to that that one woman can represent all different interests of um, like a whole, let's put it like a whole nation, like the women of one nation, which is not true because, um, I mean, as we know, uh, in, in when we have conflicts, like a lot of interests are, um, need to be uh, negotiated and 
one woman of a like a certain um, ethnicity or a certain age cannot just all even if she knows has a huge knowledge about what is going on she cannot represent all the different interests that are um, it should be talked about and here we can see that for some political actors is just like ticking the box to say, ah, okay, we are actually implementing the WPS agenda. We have one woman um, in at that program, or we uh, have one uh, woman as a, as, as a political leader, but it's not enough. So I think there is kind of like um, a setback, but n at the same time, I think there's also like a discussion about that. Um, regarding localizing the WPS agenda, um, I think, um, as my colleague also already mentioned, uh, when it comes to informal processes, this is like a question, um, how can we make them visible? Because I would say most of the informal, uh, pro like informal um, processes are, um, um, are a good example of how the WPS agenda is being localized. I can give you one example from, um, from Germany. Uh, with the uh, conflict or the war now in Ukraine, um, um, many uh, people of African descent have fled um, to, to, to Germany and other European um, um, uh, countries. Um, but because the EU has really strict, um, um, how can I say, really strict uh, uh, guidelines to wh who is the EU letting in or not, um, different uh, informal uh, groups uh, came together and set up different uh, informal um, routes for people of African descent to enter somehow the European Union. And there again, this is like something for a general group, but um, among uh, women's rights organizations and feminist organizations, there were like political groups that were um, targeting um, or looking at um, um, uh, women coming to Germany. And of course, they're like, because they are busy in doing what they're doing, they're not like claiming or publicly they're talking about, okay, this is like something, this is linked to 1325 or, um, we want to, or we need to be part of the discussion on WPS. Um, I think this is kind of a good example to also ch show the challenge. Yeah. Yes, thank you um, for showing the, the localization. But I also wanted to, to, to add to your comment about the fact that women represent rebel groups' uh, position. And I think it's also mm -hmm. some kind of uh, thinking and. Um, that women don't have uh, the agency to have their own positions. Uh, they are not uh, actors in <laughs> perpetuating violence, which women usually do have, you know, that. And they do have their political positioning uh, in both, you know, on both sides. So it's always good to emphasize the fact that they are actors, they are perpetrators, but they are also um, agents of, of, of peace building. Um, so just like the men, we take the position of political parties or rebel groups is the same way women who are members of those groups we take. So women are not naturally peace builders. You know, they, 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 some men are also peace builders. So it's an assumption that because she's there, she's supposed to talk peace. She could actually be bringing war to the desk, you know. So, yeah. And it's good for us to realize that so that we know how to uh, intervene. So um, I'm coming to Laura and then um, she first and then... Uh, thank you to the panelists for this very interesting conversation. I am Lortal from uh, IPAR Think Tank, Senegal. Um, my question is about the localization of this uh, woman and, and peace and security agenda. Uh, I have seen that uh, there is uh, more and more national action plan that are uh, uh, developed uh, in different African countries and uh, in, in, that, in that regard, uh, African countries are, are quite in advance in terms of uh, developing this, uh, this action plan. But there's a real gap in terms of uh, uh, going from the plan to the action. And uh, I, was, um, uh, uh, I am wondering what, what is the problem? Is it a problem of governance? These plans are... Uh, are are uh, given to women ministries to be implemented, whereas the, the problems, the challenges are tr uh, transactional. So 
how can a woman, Ministry of Women, can uh, get all these uh, different things implemented when uh, we talk about health, we talk about land, we talk about education. Is it, that, is it the problem or the problem is somewhere else? Okay. Over. Thank you, please. Uh, I thank you very much for the panelists. Um, I'm Getacho from Ethiopia. Um, I have a general question uh, uh, basically associated with uh, localization uh, following uh, the question raised uh, ahead of me. Uh, you know, the world, uh, the WPS agenda um, uh, cannot be implemented in short period of time. It might mm -hmm. need uh, a process, long time, long period of time. So uh, sometimes it can be associ associated with the formal or informal curricula uh, from the bottom, uh, the undergraduate from the high school, the uh, elementary, and so on. Uh, do you have any experience or have you, have you come across with this uh, uh, example in Africa, particularly uh, associated with uh, formal or informal curricula, uh, particularly this issue in, 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 in Africa? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, please give her the microphone. Yeah. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, I don't know. I, I hope I'll be able to bring out this clearly. I wanted to to actually talk about women and uh, in relation to their contribution to conflict. I, I, I know that, uh, I don't know whether we, we are aware that even when they are not uh, directly involved in conflict, women are always part of the conflict. They are always behind their husbands, they are supplying them with food, mm -hmm. they are giving them, you know, they are always there in the conflict. So we cannot get them out of the conflict. So even when they are really not part of the conflict, and you know, uh, husbands listen to their wives. So whoever, if it's a labor group, if it's whatever, so women are always part of the conflict, and we should not, not forget. I don't know what the agenda talks about, but uh, they're part. But I, I would uh, want to ask uh, African countries or other people to draw the example of Rwanda. Rwanda has really implemented, it, I think, this piece and agenda properly. Uh, we have women all over. Yeah, they're in police, they're in security, they're in peacekeeping, they're everywhere. And this is actually is seen as part of, you know, the resource that we have. We, even in our parliament, the Senate, actually some, in some areas, the Senate... So can you go to the question now? Yeah, the, I, I'm just giving a compliment. So how, how do you separate women with their men in the, in the whatever, in the rebel, in the conflict part of it? Thank I don't you. know whether it's related to the peace and agenda, African peace and agenda. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so thank I come you. back to you. Mm. From, yeah, Miriam, do you want to start? You seem to be... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I will take on the questions, uh, like the question regarding the NAPs, the National Action Plans, um, because two things. So uh, most of the National Action Plans uh, um, on the African continent are somehow funded through external ac uh, actors, um, um, not only by the governments themselves. Um, so, I mean, this is a question, if, a, if another country has that uh, financial resources, why shouldn't it like support other countries um, creating this national action plan? But I think we also have then to understand that there are certain limits, uh, like limitations, if, uh, for example, Sweden um, funds a national action plan um, uh, on the um, African continent, because by the end, the national government um, is in charge of that plan. Um, but what is more uh, important, and I would like to stress out, is that um, having national action plans is like a really good step, like also having uh, regional action plans. Uh, but we cannot just say, okay, there's a national action plan, now everything will be fine and we can like, like lean back and um, yeah, we can see how gender justice will be achieved. Um, so the question is always like looking at those uh, action plans and look at, okay, what are the accountability mechanisms? Are there any? Um, also when we talk ab about budgeting, because not many national action plans have actually like include um, concrete budgeting, how certain programs will be financed. And then also um, 
not a lot of action plans also show the responsibility or the, the, yeah, the shared responsibility of different ministries because um, it matters whether the national action plan is embedded in the federal foreign, um, of like in foreign ministry or whether it's linked to the um, um, women's ministry um, or also international cooperation. So that matters and often uh, what we can see in national action plans is that that responsibility isn't really clear. So if it's not clear on paper, how should then ministries um, decide what they're going to do, even in even more if it's a topic they're not really interested in. So yeah, that's my take on that. Dr. Hier. Oh. All right, um, look, the, the in terms of the localization, I think you've answered the third question on what the action plan is and what it does. But the, the in terms of localization um, of the plan, the agenda, sorry, um, yes, it is true that different um, national governments um, get funding of, of, for, for, for of their plans from, from you know, the UNFPA, for instance, the UN Women and the UNDP. Um, but what they really do is to fund the, um, the development of the plan itself, right? Um, the, the resourcing of the plan and implementation is often done by the government. So, for example, in South Africa, where I've been involved in, you know, uh, developing some of these plans, um, the, what the UNFPA does is to ask for government representatives in the task team that the um, um, consultant, you know, um, would always consult with and then um, follow up with, um, you know, um, um, uh, you know, f um, negotiations or um, workshops to to get the buy-in of all the relevant stakeholders, whether they be media, the government itself, um, civil society, and even ordinary women themselves. So, so that helps. One of the things that uh, that have also been done in South Africa is the um, use of what they call gender focal persons or gender focal points at, at all levels of government, from the local to the uh, provincial and up to the national, um, across departments. And it speaks to what um, uh, Tal was talking about in terms of, um, you know, whether it goes um, across um, 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 different levels. You know, um, so and, and across departments. So every department, if you go to South Africa, every single department has a gender focal person. Um, you know, from the top down to the bottom. Of course, there are challenges in terms of whether some of these gender focal persons are qualified, whether they've had training, whether they understand gender issues. Those challenges are often there, but there is that attempt to try and localize it in, in that sort of way from, from, from the bottom up. And uh, like I mentioned earlier on, the countries like Nigeria have also tried, tried to localize the WPS by adding their own elements of, of, of prosecution, for example, um, to, the, to the four Ps of the WP um, uh, PS. But at the end of the day, the major challenge is about um, how you know African states, uh, 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 government officials who make up these states, how they perceive women, the whole question of how men see women. Um, if, if we, as a result of the misconception of what, uh, how women are, are conceptualized, are seen, and, the, and how that inf informs behavior towards them, um, um, you see a tendency to treat um, these plans as tokens, you know, um, just things you do to tick, tick the box so that you can get more funding from the uh, bodies um, just to show that we are complying. But if, we, if there is a belief um, um, that women are actually not just um, um, victims of conflict, that they are also agents of conflict like we have established, and they are also agents of peace. They have these multifaceted roles, just like men in society. Um, and that, you know, actually, if you go back to my old talk about pre-colonial Africa, where though there was no, uh, uh, you know, um, um, uh, equality between men and women in society, but women were more highly regarded as, as individuals, as humans, you know, than they were after the colonial era that's, that came with the proprietization and commodification of relationship between men and women. So for me, that perception is very important. We should visit the question of how do men see women? Once we can try and resolve that and change the perception of women as equal beings as men, um, uh, then we would, we would begin to address some of the challenges that go with implementing um, WPS, either at the um, you know, um, um, regional or you know, um, national level. In terms of uh, curricula, 
um, um, there's, be, there's, there's an effort to, uh, there has been effort to try and, um, we've, we've, we've actually recommended peace education um, that, that looks at, um, you know, uh, you know, me, you know putting women into the curricula. If you look at most social studies um, 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 syllabus in, in most African schools, both even from high school to the university, you find that, that in, especially in history, they talk about men as heroes. But they neglect the fact that women were also part of those nationalist struggles, for example, um, that, that uh, you know, um, brought um, this independence. In, in, in Zululand, I've always told people whether they know that King Shaka, patriarchal as the Zulu uh, 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 kingdom is, um, King Shaka, a, a very powerful king of, of the Zulu kingdom, um, insisted that you know, his, 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 his bodyguards, all his bodyguards were women. And over 40% of his army were women, and many of them were commanders. So I will ask them, where does it come from that in Zulu culture, Women don't talk in public or cannot look at men when they are talking. So how did Shaka uh, uh, give responsibilities to women who could not look at men to, because, to lead those men? So it's a question of understanding which, which, which culture you're talking about. Is it the pre-colonial African patriarchy or you're talking about the post-colonial one, which in my view was more injurious to women than the, than the former? Wow, and that's very true. Thank you so much. Um, so before I take the, the next question, I just wanted to add to uh, the point about why is it that the, the national action plans are not being implemented and what could be done. Um, in, in Uganda, for example, in developing the national action plan was to bring all these ministries to the table. Because most of the issues you talk about, education, health, you know, should be taken into account in the planning for the different ministries and agencies. And if they are at the table, while the national action plans are being developed, then they include it in their plan, then it gets budgeted for. So it makes it a bit easy, you know, than for us to talk about uh, budgets coming from these other countries and people prioritizing the development of national action plans as part of their own national action plans in their own countries. And not seeing that they also have some issues around gender-based violence and, you know, extremism and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'll take the last three questions. Yeah. So, um. so thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank you, Doctor. Uh, my question is, my question goes to you. And two months uh, ago, I gave a conference on uh, uh, the way we use African cultural element in peace process, peace building process. And there were a lot of Christian debate on women, uh, the role of women. And um, one of my men said, um, when you decide to build a village, you must do it with a woman. Another one say, yes, whoever. When, when you decide to destroy, to burn a village, you do it with a woman. <laughs> Doctor, um, how do you explain, how do you understand feminism in Africa, in Africa uh, context or perspective? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting question for you, Prof. Um, Dr. Eze. Could you give him the microphone? We need to be careful when we give subject matter experts uh, the position of moderating. <laughs> <laughs> because, because he's causing a problem for we, the audience. But I, I wanted to uh, inform Prof also as a matter of additional information. And I was part of the team that developed the first Nigerian action plan. Um, what has also happened that is making it gain traction is the fact that states in Nigeria are beginning to develop state action plans. Mm -hmm. In fact, some local governments in the north are actually even developing local government action plans, which is different even though uh, they, it takes inspiration from the national and state action plan. They are totally different because the dynamics are different. So for the... Um, not eastern part of Nigeria where you have issues around religion that is also um, 
uh, meshed within the cultural uh, dynamics of Islam, where it inhibits women's participation in decision-making process. They are using that route you know, to ensure that they anchor the WSPS agenda within the context of, context of their peculiarities and within the context of the local action plan, which I think is very in, in innovative. The question? I made it very clear that I was going to make an additional comment. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Dr. Eze, for sharing that perspective from Nigeria. Um, I come back to you, uh, the panelists. Um, Prof, you had uh, the question about feminism. And yeah, yeah, which is actually a trap question, like I said, uh, because um, <clears throat> it can get you into trouble. But um, I'm used to being in trouble, so I'll just say it anyway. Um, so so um, he's, I think basically he's trying to want me to distinguish between um, Western feminism and African feminism. Um, and um, there, there, there are qualitative differences between the two, and it starts from you know, the worldview, the, the ontological conception of, of the human being, and that, that has fundamental difference between, between the two, and the fact that one, which is the African feminist um, uh, uh, you know, ideology, uh, believes in, in what, the, what we also refer to as uh, cultural feminism or difference feminism, the fact that uh, men and women are different uh, physiologically, um, and 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 in, in the African worldview, men and women um, work in parallels, but towards the same goal of 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 the good of society, the good of the community. So um, you you will find that um, the idea of 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 talking about um, gender equality um, does not then arise, but what we what we what we what we what we what we uh, privilege is um, uh, gender equity, the equality of opportunities for both men and women, um, in such a way that we allow them to also thrive in their in their differences. And if you read um, um, Ifi Amadume's books. Um, on, 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 on this subject, um, you will see how she talks about how men and women, you know, transversed, uh, uh, you know, uh, different gender roles in society, and the use of um, names, for example, um, is, is, is one of the one of those. Um, so, so I, my personal feminist politics is African feminism. Um, believing that um, men and women are different, but that we complement each other and we work towards um, the same goals. And um, if it is rooted in, in the philosophy of hum women as human beings, just as men, and therefore um, having and deserving of the same rights in society that uh, men have. And once you understand it that way, um, the question would be how we can sit around the tables and um, navigate our differences uh, in order to arrive at uh, you know, the same goals. That is my personal point politics do not crucify me for it and I don't have to explain <laughs> that to anyone. <laughs> thank you thank you, thank you very much for that. I was going to come on you but um, Dr. Eze made a comment so I will leave the debate about feminism but just to say there are African feminisms. Yes, uh, so you. probably that's your point of feminism so let's leave it there. Just, so thank you very much for saying it is your own feminism. We will leave it at that. Yes Miriam. <laughs> Thank you for that for that comment. Um, I think, yeah, when we talk about different ways of feminism, um, I think this also comes into into the play, like um, how we talk about it and where we can also find sources of knowledge. Um, um, and this is also linked to peace education because yes, in the books and at school, um, this is definitely like a place where we should learn more about um, gender dynamics and gender relations. But I think what we should not also neglect is the power of um, um, oral history, which is really important also on the African continent in music and, and, and poems and, and, and so on in proverbs. Um, so I think maybe this is also a task for us, like going home um, um, in the evening, thinking about, OK, where are the sources um, of stories and knowledge uh, about what we um, define um, as feminism? These are just my two cents. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so thank you very much. Um, question? No, no comment. Okay. Please question because we need to begin to close now. Okay. 
I actually, uh, I don't know that I'm a gender person, but uh, I'm cross-cutting. I, ha I have a number of issues I'm working on. But when I look at gender and how people really tend, maybe you should go to, to Helen. Um, <laughs> I think gender is one-sided. When we talk of gender balance, we should look at both men and women. And uh, so are we looking at both sex and I mean men and women, or we are just looking at women? And again, I had someone, uh, some good speech from uh, the vice president's wife in Kenya, the one that this that fared in today. She was talking about boy child. You know, the, our boys are neglected. We are talking of girls, everything is around women, and you know, boy child is really being left behind. Our boys are really taken by drug, drugs, they are alcoholics, and uh, what? So who looks after these boys? Who, who talks for them? Are men talking about these boys? So tell me about your feminism. When we talk about <laughs> feminism, or how, where, where, where are these I issues? Tell us. <laughs> tell us. Well, I don't know why you're putting me in this uh, box, but... Um, no, I mean, it's, so, it's fine. There's no problem because we each have our personal politics when it comes to this. And uh, thank you very much for bringing up the issue of the boy child. Um, I do not have any problems with that. Uh, but when we talk about gender, we are not talking about sex. So gender, uh, social, it's a social relation. Um, uh, and we're talking about rules that are assigned to boys, girls, men, and, and women. Uh, but w within the context of peace building, because that's what we are here for, business unusual, we are saying, outside boys and girls, that women are not at the table. And we've got perceptions about what do women do when they are at the table. And you know, we've tried to bring out that debate that women do have their own personal politics, and they do have the agency to be actors and perpetrators of violence, but they also have the agency to be peace builders. You know, but what we are saying is that they've not had the opportunity, as men have, to be at the peace table. And what Prof has told us today is that women do have informal peace building processes that you know, go on in the communities. And we need to recognize, acknowledge that. But the question will be, how do we count it and how do we reflect these grassroots informal women's efforts to reflect at the peace table? Because it has worked to keep communities peaceful, you know, to contribute to peace building. But we are not looking at it from that way. Boy child, I still feel we've not got to the point where we need to say we've left the boys alone because we've still not met up in terms of the numbers when we are talking about gender equality. Yes, there are some countries that have made progress in terms of girls' child education, and they are catching up. Yes, some countries are about to overtake, you know, the boys. You know, but we've not got to the point where we should be worried about that, you know, yes, we've not got to the point. Depending, yes, depending on the context. Sorry, you said what is my position? You put me in the box, and I'm saying that we've not reached. Yes, there are places where we need to pay attention to both, and I'm not saying we should not pay attention to the boy child. Please, within your project, take care of that very well. And within my project, I focus on the girls, and somewhere in the middle, we shall meet up. And then we'll be creating equality, and at some point we get to gender equality. That's what we are all here for. OK, so don't crucify me. Um, yes, Miriam wants to say something. <laughs> Could you please, in your questions and comments, take us back to business unusual, <laughs> yeah. women and peace building. Yeah. That's what we are here for. Yes. Is so. this part of that? <laughs> <laughs> OK, Miriam. Yeah. So. Coming back to your comment, I think, and then also um, linking it to uh, the WPS agenda, I think you're raising, like, I'm not agreeing with all of what you were saying, but I think you're raising a really good um, point because often then when we look uh, at those, um, at the WPS agenda, um, gender is like um, equals women, but it's not true because when we talk about gender, we talk about gendered relations, how the different identities we are having and possessing are influencing the way um, how we are regarded in society and gender does play a role there. So it's about gender identities, it's about gender dynamics, and I mean, 
most of all, it's about like um, uh, the gender power hierarchies we have um, in society and also which we can see then in conflicts because conflict is about power, who gets what, mm -hmm. Who, how are we going to share the power or not? I mean, this is, we also have to ask that, that kind of question and how we're going to redistribute the power. And I think this is where the gender lens is coming in and um, also the, the comment you made before, how can we, um, or we should not like separate um, uh, women and men in conflict, or you were saying like, um, uh, uh, behind every man kind of there is a, and I think this is like a, a good example that we should not separate because there's a dynamic, even if we separate, say, okay, we have maybe here like a group of women and a group of men, um, we cannot neglect that there's somehow a relation um, and a, a dynamic between those groups. And I think yeah. this is what the WPS agenda is trying to show, uh, that you cannot talk about this one topic without the other one. Yeah, but recognizing the power dynamics yes. within them. Okay, so. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Prof wants to say something that we can take. <laughs> that would be the last comment. <laughs> okay, I so. Comment. I don't have a comment. Nancy Walker from the Wilson Center. My question is unfortunately, our colleague from the State Department was not able to join us today. So, my question to our distinguished panelists and our very distinguished moderator is what message do you have for the United States government? Okay. Okay. So, do you want to take that? Another comments or questions? Yes, Hannah? Okay. No, Dr. Walker mostly took my question. Um, <laughs> she did. I, I, was, I was just lamenting that um, a friend from the State Department could not be here. But the U.S. released its um, policy on women, peace, and security, or act, passed the act on it in 2017 and released its strategy in 2019 and released its first report in 2020. So a, a bit new to the game on some of these things. Um, it's very hard security centric in the approach. Uh, a lot of focus on military, counterterrorism, and uh, with a lot of the solutions focused on inclusion of women in negotiations and training. So uh, in, in addition to, to Dr. Walker's question, is that still the right approach? Is that a good strategy? Is that sufficient, that very particularly hard security? So particularly from, from people working in this space, I would like to hear that. Um, Okay. Thank you. And the last one behind Hannah. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I vowed that I was not going to say anything, but something. Right. Let me quickly say this. Look, I, I think again I go back to the lens of what we are using to examine all these things. I'm taken back to one of the prominent scholars in Africa, Jimmy Adesina, so once said in a discussion. The lens that we use to view gender dynamics is incorrect. Because in an African society, uh, I'll give an example, and he gave it as well. Um, when, you, when a child has eaten and thanks the, for the food, he thanks both parents. The concept of missus is foreign to an African. There's nothing. My mother dies with her surname. She's called by her surname. Now, he spoke about, Chris spoke about the issue of pre-colonial gender lenses and post-colonial gender lenses. The post one, in my view, is very adulterated, influenced by misunderstandings by the colonialists and all the other lists that have come in to, to, to view the African science. So let's go back a little bit to what I said yesterday, to our daily practices, business unusual. When I thank my parents, I thank them both. What does it mean? They're equal. You speak about Shaga, King Shaga. That's my history. His advisors were his sisters and mothers, part of them. And they, because of the way that the man is the head of the house, they knew where to speak and not to speak so that they did not disrupt the social order of the Zulu nation. You can say they were suppressed because they were not speaking in public. But I'll tell you, go back from KZ and KwaZulu Natal, go back to the Ndebele Nation in Zimbabwe. One of the influencers were women who influenced, who became king, who succeeded mm -hmm. King Mziligas. 
But they did it behind closed doors not to upset the social order. But because of the modernist in quotes thinking that we can all stand and have two pulpits in one church, I think that is where we're missing it. I'm not saying churches in a religious place. So let's go back and look at that. Say, do not suppress, but give any person, just like if I'm not a chief and I have a point to say, I cannot say it to the chief's face, but I can say it diplomatically and he will listen. Like I did say yesterday, it is not the duty of the majority to, go to, 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 to vote out the minority, but it is the duty of the minority to convince the, mi the majority that they are incorrect. I hope I'm not preaching. Yeah, thank you so much. I and and if, if I forgot to mention that uh, Muzilikazi was a cousin to, to Shaka Zulu and fled to southern Matabele land after disagreeing with him. Can you go to the question? To avoid his wrath. Hey, Prof. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much um, for that. Uh, the reflections are, um, are true, and I think it's something I also believe in, the fact that um, colonization, development, disrupted uh, you know, the, the values that we had and took away a lot of rights of women you know, in terms of defining the man as the head of the household and how we've been naming the structures and you know, disrupting that in the name of development. So um, I do agree with you. Thank you for, for saying that, even though you say you didn't want to say something. So I'm coming back to the, to the panelists. Um, you wanna go for recommendations recommendation. for US policy makers. Anna talked about those frameworks by the US, you know, uh, someone was supposed to have come here, but we need these recommendations to go to the State Department. And I would also ask the audience here and online if they do have some recommendations as well. We are not taking questions, we are not taking comments. We want recommendations, you know, that would change the African women, peace and security agenda. Who wants to start? All right, so I'll go first. So um, <coughs> this was, my, oh, woman first. No, 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 no. Okay. That's not what it means. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> uh, always when it's convenient. All right. Um, so, so to the US, um, um, I would say that, you know, rather than continually passing um, resolutions and, and protocols, um, identifying, you know, the spaces where women feature the most and mainstreaming their informal peace uh, activities into formal peace processes would be a better alternative. Uh, because the fact that women are not significantly represented in the formal sphere of peace building does not erase the reality of their you know, existence in the informal sphere or the significance of the work you know, um, that, that they do there. All right? So that would be a one sentence message that I would, I would, I would you know, give. Um, in terms of the human security approach to peace building that Hannah was talking about, yes, it is important. And it is important because the, uh, the, 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 the human security approach to peace building um, um, identifies people as, as a means and end to the peace building project. Right? And when you look at the people-centric uh, approach, it means, therefore, that you begin to pay attention to the kind of people uh, you, uh, that, 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 that are involved. And that's where uh, it presents an opportunity for um, you know, both men and women to be part of um, the process um, equally. Uh, you know, and, and, and I must state that I actually do, uh, um, uh, believe that you know, d even though I think that uh, men and women are different, and I, I, I see that even... Um, Helen is beginning to agree um, that um, um, you know, even though they are different, um, it doesn't obviate from the fact that we deserve equal opportunities, even as societies um, evolved. And I agree with you, Vuyo. Um, it, 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 it all depends on on how we define power, you know, and where we believe that power is located. If we believe that power is only in the public spheres and only in the public spaces, um, then we misunderstand the power behind the throne, for example. We, we, we misunderstand, you know, uh, where other power dynamics uh, 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 occur, which we, we, where, and, and those are spaces where women, you know, feature uh, quite prominently. And I think that we should expand the lens, uh, you know, to studying these informal places and then, you know, finding ways to, 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 to uh, you know, mainstream them into a formal process. And one, one specific recommendation in this regard is for um, um, governments in Africa 
um, not just depending on you know um, international organization agencies, but for government in Africa to begin to commission research, um, you know, big time into extracting knowledge. Uh, around the work that women do at, at informal levels and then ask for specific suggestions on how to mainstream them into formal processes so that the two um, go together. Once we, be, once, we, once we do that, we'll find that women are actually active and um, then we'll begin to ask different questions around maybe the quality of that um, activism. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, so my recommendations um, in the context of um, the US is that, yeah, um, like I, I totally um, agree, like moving away from this notion that military intervention can actually bring peace or justice, uh, whatever the definition is by, by the US regarding that. But I think also th what we have to acknowledge is that the US is a powerful actor, right? So um, what the US has the capacity for is also to create um, um, uh, spaces to create um, forms of dialogue or initiate um, dialogues between different um, 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 actors when we talk about conflict. But then maybe just stop there because often what we can see is then um, that it is not just about creating space, but also like keeping the control. And if we really want to achieve um, conflict resolution, uh, usually it, it is then being done uh, by the actors themselves that being involved because they usually know best um, what to do. I think this is like, I know it's a huge task, but I think this could be like a good approach um, to actually then also lead the W, like leave the WPS um, agen agenda being unfolded. And one last point um, that goes into the direction of the uh, remark you did in the beginning and is also linked to the US. Um, now we have more and more countries also acknowledging um, that uh, gender equality plays a role in uh, their foreign policy and um, also the US. So when we talk about um, feminist foreign policy, uh, which does I think it was yesterday, um, there was a huge conference in Berlin um, uh, with a lot of ministers um, 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 talking about that topic. I think what we always have to uh, keep in mind that by the end, it's not about telling someone uh, or a different country how to do what kind of feminism. It's in the end, it's about like solidarity and also understanding that there are different approaches to achieve uh, what we call a feminist peace. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, recommendation? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you so much, panel members. Uh, my recommendation, not uh, sending it to this government, but it's what I think about the way forward. I think uh, my recommendation is based on uh, what the, an African author called Ngugi Wathiong say: decolonizing of mind. Uh, by decolonizing of mind from the perspective of gender equality, uh, I think it's very important that we decolonize our mind, whereby we think women uh, come behind men or shouldn't say in public. I mean, it's about rethinking about how we perceive women and their roles in the society. It's uh, our responsibility as men and women to remember the, this saying which you touched upon. Uh, behind every strong man, there's a strong women, woman. In that case, my recommendation is that women should lead us, not just come on table, because they're very strong and they can uh, take us somewhere, but not alone. Men and <laughs> women. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and, and for me, um, it's building on what Prof um, Isika said about um, the informal processes. And my recommendation would be that more funding is provided to grassroots women's organization, you know, to continue the informal peace work um, that stabilizes communities in fragile and, and conflict settings. Uh, many times um, I see a lot of calls for proposals from the State Department on women, peace, and security, but majority of the requirements 
cannot be met by grassroots women's rights organizations. You know, they are quite tough. They ask in for very huge amount that, you know, most of these organizations cannot really, you know, reach the threshold or have the capacity to develop to that level of very technical uh, proposal. So within the feminist foreign policies, for example, um, um, how do you channel resources, you know, to these groups through some, you know, larger organizations um, that have the capacity, you know, to be able to, uh, to assess them. Uh, but also one of the things that we really also want to request from the U.S. is uh, why you develop your foreign policies to address women, peace, and security agenda in Africa. Can you also look into the women, peace, and security issues in the U.S.? Uh, because we know that they exist. We see a lot of things happening. We know that violence against women is there. Um, happening. We know you say you have institutions that respond to them, but they're still happening, you know. Um, so how can you also improve, you know, on those responses on issues of violent extremism, the role of women and youth, you know, and all of those issues that you want us to change in Africa that you should also look inward, you know, in terms of how you address some of these uh, human rights uh, issues. So, it's been an interesting evening, um, exciting audience, exciting panelists, exciting chairs, <laughs> exciting chair, speaking about uh, this. Um, it's, 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 I really wish we could continue the conversation, but like we usually do, um, we speak about these things as we go home, you know, when we meet in the next forum. I know a lot of people are waiting for me to come down, you know, so they challenge me about my feminism and about women, peace, and security. Um, so um, thank you very much for making it very vibrant. You know, it's been very interesting. Uh, thank you again to our speakers for your insightful perspectives and to you, the audience online, for joining us. We didn't hear so much from you. Probably um, the timing is not very good, but uh, we are happy with those who have been with us until the end. The conference will continue tomorrow at the Whistle Center at 9 a.m. Uh,